Hello, everyone. Good evening from uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Shira Efron, and I'm the Diane and Guildford Glazer Foundation Director of Policy Research at Israel Policy Forum. Uh, it's long-winded. I wanted to welcome those of you who are joining Israel Policy Forum IPF for the first time today, and when, welcome back our returning uh, viewers. Uh, before we begin with our program, I want to thank our supporters. Our work, including today's program, is made possible by you. Uh, we rely on donors like you to produce free expert analysis, objective analysis, and informational, uh, informational content on the most pressing issues affecting the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, conflict, such as today's uh, timely briefing. And if you, if you enjoy our webinars, uh, but don't yet support our work, please do so by visiting israelpolicyforum.org backs of support. So as you may have uh, heard, violence uh, sadly is on the rise in the West Bank again as the Palestinian Authority's security forces have become um, increasingly absent in the Northern, Northern West Bank. And Israel, the IDF, um, has been stepping up its uh, Area A incursions. Uh, cities like Jenin and Nablus have become regular sites of clashes between Israeli forces and Palestinian militants. A development that could have a detrimental impact on West Bank security and also Israel's security. Um, just last week, uh, a gunfight that killed an Israeli officer and two Palestinian militants prompted Israel to shut down two West Bank checkpoints, which have since been, been reopened, and suspend Israeli work permits of uh, uh, Kufr Dan residents. Uh, killing of Palestinians and terror attacks against Israelis in the West Bank are both on the rise. Um, Israeli, Israel's operations in the West Bank aim to prevent terror attacks in Israel, and they did initially succeed in doing so in the wake of this spring uh, terror wave and until this week, uh, when a Palestinian from Kilkilia committed a suspected terror attack in Hulon, where he beat to death an 84-year-old uh, Israeli woman. Um, but it's also worth noting that at, at the time of rising violence, um, and the, 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 all the talk about PA's weakened state. Uh, today at the UN, right after our webinar, um, UN, uh, Prime Minister uh, Yair Lapid is reportedly going to express his support for the two-state solution. The first time he has done so openly as Prime Minister and the first time an Israeli Prime Minister has done so I think since uh, 2016. So to unpack uh, the state of the West Bank and its implications for Israel's security, and the prospects for two states and for Palestinian security. Uh, we are grateful to be joined today by two of my favorite analysts in the world, uh, Ibrahim uh, Idalalsha, director of the Horizon Center for Political Studies, uh, who's had uh, over two uh, decades of service with the American consulate in East Jerusalem, uh, since then closed down, and, um, um, and Amos Arel, uh, Israel's number one defense and national security analyst, uh, uh, defense correspondent for arts. Uh, hi, Amos. Hi, Ibrahim. Hi, Shira. Amos, I, I want to start with you first, because uh, if you can provide us just with some background, um, you know, you're, you, you've followed uh, uh, waves of violence in the West Bank uh, all your life, I think, or for, for a good number of decades. But what, what, what are we seeing today? Um, what, what is the character, if you can describe the, 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 these young Palestinians um, uh, committing acts of violence? Uh, what are, I guess, uh, what is the link between uh, this wave of violence and Israel's incursions into Area A, obviously areas that are supposed to be in Palestinian full control, uh, and 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 subsequently, how do you see the security situation deteriorating in the in the West Bank? Okay, so uh, first of all, I, I think we should trace this back to uh, March of this year. This is when the latest round of violence began. We can go all the way back to forty-eight or sixty-seven, but re more recently. Um, during uh, March, we saw a rise in attacks against Israelis from the Palestinian side, as you mentioned, mostly by young men who were not part of any kind of uh, organizational structure, not members of Hamas, Fatah, or uh, Islamic Jihad. Uh, there were quite a few attacks between March and May, and uh, around 20 Israeli uh, citizens, civilians, uh, who died. Israel, in response, did two things. It deployed battalions, quite a lot of uh, IDF battalions, for the first time 
in many years uh, along the Green Line, mostly to try to prevent um, uh, unsurveilled uh, entrances of uh, Palestinians into Israel, because in most of these incidents happened with people uh, who came that way through the um, um, different uh, uh, openings in, in the uh, barrier. And after that, it began sending uh, units to make arrests, mostly in the Northern West Bank, as you mentioned, the Nablus and Jenin uh, area. What happened, unsurprisingly, is that many of these um, operations inside the, those areas uh, were met with quite uh, aggressive response from the other side as well. There were all kinds of local uh, networks or local uh, groups that uh, went uh, that um, um, uh, tried to to protect uh, their areas. They worked without a direct connection to the Palestinian authorities and sometimes against its will. And this, of course, brought uh, more friction. Uh, quite quickly, the number of uh, Palestinian casualties um, rose. Uh, by now, we have close to 90 Palestinians uh, who died since the beginning of this year. This is uh, the highest number for uh, seven years. And what we have is now a sort of a vicious circle. Um, there are attempts by Palestinians to attack Israelis. There are um, op IDF operations inside um, Area A, as you mentioned. Uh, most of these um, operations are met with um, armed Palestinians, uh, gunmen who, who shoot back. Um, in most cases, there are Palestinians who get shot and killed, and then, of course, others want to retaliate. And gradually, this not only happens inside places like the Janine refugee camp, but this is leaking, so to speak, to the roads, the different roads uh, along the uh, around the West Bank, mostly in the northern part. And in recent days, we've seen almost every night there were attacks, there were attempts to shoot at uh, cars traveling on the West Bank roads, whether uh, army cars or in many cases, settlers' cars. So we know what the potential of damage is if something like this um, succeeds. For instance, next Sunday when it's Erev Rosh Hashanah, the high holidays are coming, everything is more tense, there are more and more battalions deployed and everybody's on high alert. Uh, this has political implications as well because uh, Lapid, as you mentioned, he he did speak. He, he is speaking right now with the UN, but he's mostly worried, of course, about the first of November, about the elections, and uh, he's perfectly aware of the fact that any major incident would present him as somebody who's not able to protect Israel's security and so on. And this is why what they're trying to do right now is mostly to to put out uh, fires. Uh, one final word. Um, most of these groups, as I said, are local. They're not getting any kind of orders from Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Sometimes they get money from uh, Hamas. And the problem for Israel mostly uh, regarding this tactical threat is how to collect information or intelligence about groups that don't obey orders from anybody. These are um, local groups of two, three, four young men, sometimes lone wolves attacks. And then there's a problem of intelligence, how many, uh, how much information you can get uh, before they act and are you um, able to prevent that uh, before it happens. For the time being, uh, there aren't that many lethal incidents, but my fear is that as we approach the elections, uh, we will see uh, more and more of these uh, attacks and more and more killings on both sides. Oops, sorry, Ibrahim, I'll get to you in just a moment, but uh, you know, Amos, you just bring up two really important points. I think it could be the political calculation, but also as attacks could get become more lethal, do you, do you see a scenario in which Israel will, will be dragged into a more uh, serious uh, military operation than what we are seeing today? Um, because, uh, as, as you mentioned, the prime minister would not want to look uh, weak in the face of Palestinian terrorism. But on the other hand, uh, you know, around the violence being dragged into this, a prolonged operation in the West Bank would, would not be, I, I assume, uh, politically very appealing either. So um, how do you assess the, the, the odds of that happening? Or it all, happen it all depends on this micro tactical incident. It does depend on, on, on exactly on that, on uh, what they call the strategic corporal, whether a gunman or an army or, or a, 
uh, a junior uh, commander in the IDF, if somebody makes a, a, a huge mistake, then the implications could be uh, quite uh, serious. Uh, Lapid, in a way, is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, he doesn't want to be presented as weak, as you mentioned. He cannot seem too leftist because he he's fighting for votes against Netanyahu and against uh, Gantz. He's taking a risk with his speech in the UN. We'll probably address that later on. But he needs to look tough on, on, on security, on protecting Israeli lives, and so on. However, there's no point of another defensive shield. If we look back at the operation in 2002, the height of the Second Intifada, where the IDF reoccupied all Palestinian towns in the West Bank, this is not a similar case because there's no hierarchy. There are no wanted men on the other side, or there are only a few. It's not an, There are no organizations. You need to fight it there, uh, there for the time being. So I think what the IDF and the Shin Bet would recommend is that if there are more and more of these attacks, maybe they'll go to a focused operation for a few days, uh, a specific operation which would be focused on Janine. This could, I hope that this could be controlled and not get out of hand. This could be more serious than what we're witnessing right now. And then again, not um, um, drag the, the whole West Bank in and would, may not lead to a direct confrontation with the Palestinian authorities, uh, security forces. But we should prepare for a worst case scenarios Again, I can't see anybody in their right mind um, um, recommending right now reoccupying the West Bank cities, all West Bank cities. It's not in the cards right now. But but everything, as I said, is also affected by the specific incident. If there is a, God forbid, a family killed on its way to um, uh, New Year's Eve uh, next Sunday, then uh, all pol all Israeli politics would look different and react uh, differently, the political uh, arena or map would react differently to such an incident. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, um, Ibrahim. Um, so, so you know, I must describe the challenge that this uh, those young young Palestinians are uh, posing for for the Israeli side, but this seems to also pose a challenge for the Palestinian side. Because I, I have two questions. We talk a lot about Palestinian succession, about uh, competition uh, among the leadership, about Fatah's crisis. You know, it's not just anymore like Fatah Hamas, right? We have big divisions also within. If you can, can you tie uh, a link between what's happening at the top and what we're seeing on the street? And also, there's been a lot of criticism from the Israeli side. Um, that the PA security forces have been absent, that they're actually not doing enough to contain the violence. Um, can, you, can you explain uh, this growing absence? And of course, we've seen some other stuff in, in Nablus this week, but, but, but the general trend of growing absence in terms of the Palestinian security forces. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shira. Um, um, actually, if I may, I would just uh, like to maybe present a uh, few factors that I think have contributed to the current state um, of, PA, of PA security forces, PA in general weakness, uh, mainly in the Northern West Bank, but frankly also in other parts of the West Bank, including Hebron, although the situation there is a bit different and focuses more on the PA facing the challenge of families and clans who are armed, protected, and you know there's a problem of inter enforcement of you know, internal law and order. But leaving that aside, I think, you know, um, if we zoom in on the situation in, in Jenin and Nablus in particular in the past few uh, months and weeks, uh, I would actually say that there are a few factors or reasons behind the weakness that we have seen. And we continue to see, despite the incidents in, in Nablus yesterday, and I'll explain how yesterday was not, or the, you know, like Tuesday and Wednesday, incidents in Nablus were not exactly a PA basically coming back to act, but in fact, there were also signs of weakness in the way that they handled and tackled the problem in that list. Now, first of all, you know, I have to tell you, and I know, you know, I'm not going to basically try and prioritize or like go in a, in a sequence of precedence uh, in terms of which factor is more relevant. But it's important to know that the PA and Abu Mazen's narrative online of the PA being a vehicle for statehood and negotiations would bring in uh, you know, uh, advancement on in the national aspirations of Palestinian people have essentially failed, not only in the eyes of the older generation, but especially in the eyes of the younger generation, those who were born post-Oslo. People who are like older uh, may still 
you know, compare life between before and after Oslo and see some differences, some advancements, some successes and some failures. But this new generation that you see in the streets, uh, the ones who were born post Oslo basically have nothing. I mean, everything about Oslo was taken for granted and they've been, you know, living the same kind of, uh, you know, difficulties and situation with no hope. So that, you know, in addition to the fact that Hamas is pushing a narrative that, you know, only by force and maybe contacts with Israel with direct or indirect, you can achieve things, you know, the narrative of them taking power in Gaza and continuing that way has in some ways resonated, especially with the younger generation. But, you know, again, this is one of the factors and I'm not going to focus and say the only problem is that there is lack of political horizon. If we have one, then the situation will fix itself or will actually improve automatically. As important as that one is, you also have other problems, you know, uh, and, and, and other factors. Another factor is the difficulties that the PA is facing economically and financially. And, you know, plans and rumors about, uh, you know, for the past three or four years, the PA has not really been paying uh, full salaries to the public sector employees, including security forces. Um, you know, you have rumors now about an early retirement package that will push, you know, 50% of the wages bill down uh, in, a, in a span of three years, uh, and, you know, but that also includes the security services. Um, so you have also a problem of morale and uncertainty when it comes to, uh, you know, like uh, earning bread. It's not only about political context. You have like really immediate problem. You have perceptions of corruption. Uh, out there that, uh, you know, whether true or not, we're not going to judge, but basically you have a huge, basically, um, I would say, uh, 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 disgruntled public that sees the, the current Palestinian uh, authority uh, as corrupt and as not serious about actually tackling those corruption issues. So that adds to uh, undermine the PA's, uh, you know, I wouldn't actually say physical force, they do have physical force, but the problem of legitimacy which is uh, another sort of serious problem. And last year, you know, there were supposed to be elections. And again, 35 to 40% of the Palestinian people were born after Oslo. Those who have never had a role in any political activities and any, you know, say about who rules them and who not, who is better Fatah or Hamas or X or Y or Z, they feel completely marginalized and isolated with no real uh, role. The other factor which you actually alluded to or mentioned earlier is another serious problem, in my opinion. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not about ranking, you know, the you know precedence of which factor is more relevant. I think it's a complex situation, and all these factors together, you know, bring us to uh, a problem. Another uh, problem, which is, you have, uh, you know, the serious problems between and compete, you know, competition, uh, positioning for succession, uh, even before succession is happening. You know the, the the struggle over you know between power centers within the ruling party has not is not only between individuals in the upper echelons it is it also has following you know uh, an impact on the on the grassroots uh, in some areas of the West Bank you have people who are completely disconnected from the Fatih leadership because their superiors or, or the ones that they actually work with and they are loyal to in terms of a patronage system that they have are completely alienated. You know, a, a good example to that uh, uh, is actually uh, Janine. Uh, you, know, you have people there who are completely disgruntled. They're against the Fatah leadership, the formal one. They're allied with one of the dismissed Fatah uh, uh, officials, or two of them, in fact. And, you know, whatever they do, it's actually not only against Israel, but basically against the, uh, you know, the Palestinian Authority and the ruling influential uh, individuals within the leadership. So all these problems together, I think, you know, uh, form form or constitute the current phenomenon that we have, which is the weakness of the PA in controlling the security situation in those specific areas. And, you know, and it's not a secret, and I think, you know, maybe uh, Hamas has been following, and you uh, also, Shira, you know, Hamas has a stated policy of maintaining control in, in Gaza, but also working to undermine the PA's control in the West Bank. This is not a secret. This is actually, you know, something that they declare as part of their strategy. And they, they have succeeded both, you know, like Hamas and Islamic Jihad, in recruiting elements from within Fatah, especially the disgrunt disgruntled ones, not necessarily to carry out attacks against Israelis, but basically to carry, you know, I agree with Amos that there are no organizations in the sense of fully you know, hierarchical organizations that have been created in those areas, but you do have formations, formations of gunmen who basically every other uh, day, they go together, they demonstrate together in defiance of the Palestinian Authority, they shoot at Palestinian security headquarters, specifically in Jenin, but also in Nablus, and in complete defiance in broad daylight and at night, and they're not confronted 
because of the uh, weaknesses that I actually mentioned. I think one of the biggest biggest problems that the PA faces in those areas specifically, which we've seen in, in Nablus, when they went to arrest one single person, you know, Nablus in hundreds of youth completely you know, uh, disoriented youth in terms of their political affiliation, but many of them are close to Fatah, were, were in the streets fighting with the Palestinian security forces. So the concern there is not really the physical force, Hamas versus the PA, it's essentially because of the other problems and the problems within Fatah that create this hostile environment to the PA to act there. And one last remark I, I want to say on that situation to underline the problem there is that, you know, after those you know, uh, riots that took place in, in Nablus, the end result was basically for the PA to, 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 to enter into an agreement with you know, different segments of the Nablus community representatives, including you know, many of the gunmen who call themselves dens, den of lions or whatever, and they are affiliated with different, their original, if you like, affiliation is, you know, comes with different factions. By the way, one of the uh, uh, gunmen who was actually killed in an Israeli operation uh, recently, uh, Nabulsi, uh, you know, this guy was like born 2003. So like when Defensive Shield happened, he was a baby. Actually, he was not even born. Um, and, you know, his father is a preventive security officer. His known affiliation is Fatah, but he's been working with Islamic Jihad and Hamas. So we're not talking about, you know, like much of secrets there. I think, you know, understanding the situation and its complexities may require deeper, you know, zoom in on it rather than just say, well, the, the Israeli incursions actually is what, you know, weakens the Palestinian Authority security forces and prevent them from, from operating in those cities. It's, I think, far more complex than that, although this factor is another problem, but it comes as, as a symptom and not really, you know, the root cause of the problem, because if there was total control or like strong control of the Palestinian Authority, simply there would be no Israeli incursions that way. So, you know, like it's, it's, it's a situation where if you don't tackle all of these, uh, you know, then you have a problem. And by the way, if I may comment, although may, this is like, you know, could actually come later in the discussion, the prime minister, the Israeli prime minister talking about two-state solution as a pathway for this strengthens the Palestinian Authority. Now, it's, you know, they need deliverables, of course, they need a process, yes. But remember that in the past 15 years since Bumazin was there, especially under the Netanyahu government, that horizon was not there. And Bumazin was looking completely bankrupt in terms of his narrative on negotiations and, and a peaceful resolution to the conflict. Yeah, so, so we'll, get, we'll get to that, um, I, I think, in the next round. I do, I do want to ask you, because I think it is, um, it is important. I mean, you, you spoke about so many things, and it seems to me that it has to do with Israel and with the international community, but a lot with the internal Palestinian uh, stuff. And, you know, when we were talking last year about what will happen if there are elections on the Palestinian side and the implications of the elections, what if Hamas wins and takes over? But a lot of what you say now sounds to me like the implications of not having elections, uh, a lot of frustration and, and pol lack of political participation, but, but we'll get to that. Almost, you know, um, uh, Ibrahim is speaking about, you know, the, the weakness of the PA in a sense. And we know we've seen uh, Abu Mazen's approval ratings or disapproval ratings, right? It's over 80% of the population thinks he's not legitimate um, and, and the rest of his, uh, his uh, uh, crew uh, the same. Um, but we know that, and we're not going to the Netanyahu decade, but the outgoing Bennett Lapid government has adopted this approach of shrinking in the conflict and a big part of it was supposed to be strengthening the Palestinian authority uh, as an Israeli interest and it doesn't seem to have worked. Can you explain uh, why this approach fell short? Has it, has it fell short? Maybe, we, maybe we're um, underestimating its effect. Um, and what do you think Lapid is trying to do with uh, a statement on two-state solution, which clearly the, is the first one coming from this government? Uh, is it trying to signal something to, to Abu Mazen, who's going to give his speech tomorrow? Where is it to the international community? Is it for the Israeli public? Is it part of this approach, extending it a little bit in the hope that it will work? Uh, what is this about? I think you're right that the 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 approach you described never really materialized on behalf of the uh, Lapid Bennett government. And remember that the whole idea was that this um, uh, government was formed for one reason and one reason only, and that was to push Netanyahu out. Uh, remember his uh, legal problems and and so on. It was about Netanyahu 
and Netanyahu's persona more than anything else. It wasn't the usual, the last four rounds of elections, and we're unfortunately we're facing a fifth one in uh, come November, were all about Netanyahu and not about the uh, what kind of solution you want with the Palestinians or anything like that. And that's a it's quite a, a divergence from what we saw in the past. Anyway, uh, I did find a certain difference between this government and, and the, the previous one, because behind the scenes, there was more willingness, as you know, to promote some civil, uh, some gestures on civilian matters and so on. But on the other hand, I think they had a sort of a paralyzing fear from Netanyahu. We've mentioned that uh, earlier, this fear by Gantz, Lapid, and especially Bennett, that somehow Netanyahu would present us as weak, as being leftists, as giving too much uh, to the Palestinians. And this is why even when they made gestures, they were mostly done behind the scenes. Now, paradoxically, um, the Lapid-Bennett government, uh, actually under Bennett, uh, made quite a lot of gestures to Hamas. It was easier for them because Hamas never wanted to negotiate. There was no di uh, discussion of a two-state solution or any kind of a direct ne negotiations. So Israel may have acted in a way that really didn't fit its own interest. It, it, uh, um, it was really um, helpful towards Hamas in, in many ways in Gaza, while it refused to uh, pro make any kind of uh, significant progress with the PA in the West yeah. Bank. Even a year ago, immediately after the Bennett Lapid government was formed, this was after the previous operation of May, May, May 21, Guardian of the Walls. Uh, by July or August, they made the decision for the first time in more than 20 years to allow Palestinian workers from Gaza to come and work in Israel. And the numbers gradually uh, went up. Uh, today's uh, de decision is to add, I think, 1,500 more permits. We're going to raise it to 20,000 permits, which is in, in, because Gaza is such in a, such a bad economic situation. This is a big deal for Gazans. Uh, a, a worker from Gaza uh, would probably make five times um, um, uh, the salary he can make at home while working in Israel and even more, and he would provide for many other people. Now, the best example for that was the latest round of violence in early August. It only took three days, uh, but there were quite a lot of fighting uh, with the Islamic Jihad in Gaza, of course, and uh, there were close to 50 Palestinian deaths in Gaza, many of them uh, Islamic Jihad uh, members or gunmen. Uh, but Jihad also shot hundreds and hundreds of rockets all over Israel, including the Tel Aviv area. And Hamas stayed out of this uh, fighting for three days. But immediately after the ceasefire was reached, through the Egyptians mostly, Israel resumed um, uh, the permits for uh, workers from Gaza to work inside Israel. So you could uh, look at the glass and, and, you know, and try to debate whether it's half empty or, or half full. It's true that Hamas did not take part in the violence. On the other hand, it was supposed to, according to the agreement from uh, 21, to uh, restrain Islamic Jihad and prevent any kind of uh, launching of rockets towards Israel. But Hamas was never punished, so to speak, uh, for that. And immediately Israel resumed uh, um, 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 operations uh, as normal once the, uh, once the fighting ended. Uh, all of this, of course, makes the PA look even weaker comparing to uh, uh, Hamas. And we have to mention the fact that, of course, that Abbas is already 86 years old, that the uh, succession, uh, the battle for succession is already going on. But in the eyes, as uh, Ibrahim has mentioned, in, in the eyes of many Palestinians, Hamas's way seems uh, more appropriate. Uh, if you, you know, if apply pressure on the Israelis, launch at them rockets and so on, maybe you get more from them than, uh, than, than what the PA is getting. Uh, I'll try to connect that um, 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 to Lapid's speech. I think his decision to mention the two-state solution after avoiding the, this uh, issue like the plag for for quite a long time, I think it's mostly for domestic political reasons and not so much uh, regards uh, his relationship with Abbas. And of course, Lapid has refused to meet with Abbas for quite some time. The only important person in the government who uh, insists on meeting with uh, uh, Abbas and his people is, the, of course, Defense Minister Benny Gantz. I think Lapid right now needs to make uh, to uh, a, a distinction between him and his other competitors on the center left or the center right, not Netanyahu, 
but people like Lieberman uh, or Gantz, and he wants to show that he's a little bit to the left. Part of this has to do, I think, uh, with his um, uh, late attempt at appealing to the Arab Israeli voters. We all know that right now, it seems that Netanyahu is getting closer to 61 uh, seats, according to the most recent polls, because of the problem with the United Arab Party and, and, and so on. And uh, many political analysts are saying, look, there will need to be um, a, a, a massive um, uh, um, um, attempt of raising the number of Arab Israelis who vote in order to change that. Currently, the assumption is that around 40%, only 40% of the Arab Israelis would vote. If it could somehow look to them more appealing, more willing to discuss with the Palestinians and so on, if it could raise that percentage to somewhere around 50%, that might save him the elections. And I think this is the main reason why he decided um, on this uh, line of action or, 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 or he decided to, to speak about that for the first time in years, as you mentioned. We'll have to see what Abbas uh, would have to say about that. I don't think that this is a beginning of a wonderful friendship or anything like that. Really interesting you say that. I, I Almost as you know, uh, there are a lot of people in the defense echelon that um, have said that the uh, theoretically, the approach of strengthening the Palestinian authorities is a good one, but it can't just be those small uh, fiscal measures that you have to have. It, it needs to be within the context of a, a political process of horizon. And, you know, I was in IDF Central Command today. I speak with some people say like, OK, maybe this, this speech would give the signal, right? We don't know how this longest government will survive, but it could give you signal. But actually, you're explaining that the calculus is not... Uh, is not part of the bigger strategy, is not really pushing for a two-state solution, it's not even hoping that uh, the speech tomorrow uh, by Abu Mazen or two hours, it's the time uh, difference, um, will be more uh, calm, but it's actually for um, domestic political reasons. Um, before I go to Ibrahim, I forgot to mention that we really welcome audience questions. So please, uh, if you have questions uh, to Amos and Ibrahim, please type them in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will and we will get to audience questions in just a few minutes. Uh, Ibrahim, we just I, I can't avoid, you know, we're talking about the UN and uh, coincidentally we are speaking as the Prime Minister is speaking. Um, <laughs> I want to read to you something that a year ago uh, Abu Mazen said in the UN. I won't go through the whole thing, but he spoke about an initiative that the international community should uh, mention. And he says, I'm reading, I'm reading, we must state that the Israel, the occupying power, has one year to withdraw from the Palestinian territory it occupied in 1967, including East Jerusalem. Um, okay, one year passed. That hasn't happened. Uh, much less has happened. What do you think he's going to say uh, in his speech? Do you think that an Israeli in, in Lapid's speech saying two-state solution, that's going to also tone down um, his criticism towards Israel and also the steps that he might announce, right? He can announce uh, stopping coordination with Israel, which, which, which the PA decided, you know, they decided on already, but haven't implemented. They can decide on full uh, uh, state, state um, uh, UN state membership a bit. They can, they can decide on other things. So if you think this is going to have any, any effect tomorrow. Um, first of all, I think, yes, it's true that, you know, um, the Israeli prime minister uh, mentioning a uh, two-state solution by itself is not really going to create uh, momentum for a process. I mean, elections are coming up in Israel and as such, you know, a lot needs to be, you know, basically time will tell whether this will, tell, you know, like come um, or, or be translated into a policy of an elected Israeli government. But in the meantime, I think, you know, there were contacts with the uh, with Abu Mazen team, as I understand, you know, like I heard today, basically uh, asking him to pay attention to the to the statement and to uh, water down uh, the rhetoric of his uh, speech. And I say the rhetoric of his speech because, you know, Abu Mazen, yes, he mentioned last year that you have, you know, like the international community, Israel has one year, one year has passed. And here we are at the uh, same uh, uh, forum. Uh, and what is you know, like, what is it that he's going to say or declare or do? And um, frankly, my understanding is that he has strongly worded speech, especially in terms of the grievances, the massacres, the, um, you know, agonies uh, committed against the Palestinian people, etc. So the Palestinian narrative that way, which is strongly worded, and I would even say, 
you know, with a sense of frustration that way. Uh, then when it comes to options, I think the menu is huge and people, advisors were working on, uh, you know, different wordings and language that would reflect what the Palestinians want, starting with a two-state solution, uh, moving to a one-state solution, even if this is not what Israel wants, i.e. if Israel does not want one, you know, a two-state solution, uh, highlighting and underlining the, you know, the long talked about BLO Central Council resolutions, which are about revoking recognition uh, of Israel, uh, stopping security coordination, uh, you know, basically Palestinians, uh, uh, turning a page to the Oslo Agreement, practically, um, and many other things. My understanding is that all those elements are in the speech, but there is no implementation mechanism. And there was much reluctance uh, for, you know, giving another, um, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, period of time or a deadline uh, to actually say, if this does not happen in the next few months, then we will actually do this. Uh, there was much reluctance. I would pay attention, frankly, and this is from, you know, based on experience from before, not only on the written speech that was prepared for Abu Mazen, but also on what improvised, you know, things he would he could actually say because he'd done this in, in previous uh, uh, encounters. But I don't really think, again, I don't really think that, uh, you know, the, you know uh, President uh, Abu Mazen is a suicidal uh, uh, player. He's, you know, he feels cornered, he feels weakened, he feels marginalized. Uh, by many things, and I'm not going to spell them out. Uh, but essentially, I think that he feels uh, that he needs to make the outcry at the lowest and, and the highest uh, 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 possible voice that he can make. Uh, and when he comes back, then he will sit down. One of the advice that I think he got from regional and international powers was that he need to wait, uh, 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 you know, uh, the outcome of the Israeli elections. And then whatever, he, you know, he wants to decide, whatever strategy he wants to actually put for the uh, coming months or year, then, you know, it will be based on a better ground, having seen what the elections in Israel produce. Um, I think even though the, you know, they are, you know the, most of the advisors around the, the president would not really admit that this is what is going to happen. I think that there will be a very harsh, strongly worded, uh, uh, articulation of the Palestinian positions and narrative and demands. Um, but then, you know, in practice, I think this is what will happen. I think that they, they, there will be room for, uh, you know, uh, to wait for the outcome of the Israeli election. And among the, the, uh, the countries that were providing that advice is, of course, Jordan. Uh, King Abdullah, after meeting with Prime Minister Labid, he met with um, uh, President Abbas. I, I don't have a readout myself, but, you know, you can imagine. Uh, uh, what kind of advice uh, would be given based on the um, fact of the Jordanian position uh, before. Uh, on the status of the, uh, you know, full, full membership status in the UN, my understanding is that there was near a, you know, confrontation, if you will, or not confrontation, but basically sharp disagreement with the US administration. And uh, on, on this uh, uh, topic, during consultations that were taking place between the missions in, uh, in New York, it, was, it came clear that the Palestinians do not have enough votes to pass uh, such an application for an official vote. It is required to have at least nine votes, nine countries to promote a, an official vote in the UN Security Council for the Plenary, and they don't have that. And the US made it clear that they shouldn't. And I think, you know, it's not because, you know, it's two things. One, they don't want the confrontation with the US at this point. And second, uh, I think it's essentially because it's not going to pay off. So it will be part of the Palestinian demands that will be listed. But if the, the question is whether he will actually push an application based on that calculus, I think that the inclination is not to do that. But I, I, you know, as I said, you know, it's only tomorrow, so we'll have to see what the president says, especially on the improvised uh, uh, parts of uh, his speech. But that's, I think, those are the main highlights. This is like where he stands in terms of the preparations that they have made for him to uh, uh, to speak at the UN tomorrow. Um, thank you. We actually have have a couple of questions, and maybe this is some basic, but maybe Amos, I'll let you explain this. We have a, a, a question from, from one of the listeners that is um, asking to expand on the security coordination between the IDF and the PA, or lack thereof during these recent events. Okay, it's not only between the IDF and the different um, uh, PA organizations, but also Shin Bet, uh, the, the Israeli uh, domestic security agency. Uh, this has been going on for a long time, ever since the Oslo Accords. Uh, quite a lot of coordination going behind the scenes. 
Um, of course, this stopped completely during the time of the Second Intifada, but once uh, Abbas uh, inherited uh, um, um, Arafat's seat after uh, Arafat's death in late 2004, gradually cooperation uh, improved. And I think that the most uh, traumatic event for the Fatah leadership in the West Bank is, of course, their loss of Gaza in 2007, when Hamas gradually became their greatest enemy. Never pronounced, never said publicly, but their greatest fear is to lose to Hamas and to, to have the events of Gaza, June 2007, repeating themselves in the West Bank. And this is why behind the scenes, there's an ongoing cooperation between the uh, security organizations on both sides. Sometime to the extent that the uh, uh, the PA is seen as a sort of an Israeli subcontractor for Israeli security in the West Bank, and this is why many times uh, the, the the PA has been attacked as collaborators and so on. Uh, there are ups and downs, of course, but what we see uh, recently is, a, although they talk between themselves quite a lot, uh, the actual cooperation in the Northern West Bank uh, becomes a, a, a much harder to do, especially as Ibrahim has mentioned in Jenin, where those groups of armed men uh, do as they please and are not really afraid of the Palestinian Authority. If we look back, there was a period between September 2021 and March 2022, where the IDF did not enter Jenin refugee camp at all because there was an understanding with the PA that it would leave those operations, those arrests to the uh, Palestinian security organization. Nothing came out of this. And since March, the Israeli army uh, resumed operations inside the Jenin camp. So what we have right now is Israeli is Israeli forces fighting militants around Jenin and so on, while on other places, in some cases, it's Israel that's making the arrests. In some other cases, it's the Palestinian Authority, according to their own interests or sometimes uh, um, confidential Israeli requests and so on. But even now, there's cooperation going on behind the scenes. Nobody makes that public. For instance, they meet officers from both sides constantly, but it's almost it's hardly ever reported because this is extremely uneasy for the Palestinian Authority to to uh, do anything publicly about this. Thank you. Um, there's an, there are two... on this? Yeah, yeah, yes, of course, of course, sure. of course. And I also want you both, I'll just say, Ibrahim, I want you both to the next question because we have two questions from Inga Rog and from um, uh, Daniel Danielle Cohen about um, how Jerusalem ties into this. The situation in Jerusalem appears to be pretty uh, tense ahead of the high holidays. I must say I was in a... Uh, exploratory uh, visit to Temple Mount <laughs> as part of a dis disguised group. And I've seen, I saw more Jews than I've seen in ev ev ever uh, on the Mount. So I'm, I'm curious also, um, uh, what, 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 uh, how, do you, how do you expect any incidents, big numbers of visitors or provocative actions there, violations of the status quo could lead to um, um, violence also in the West Bank. So, sorry, Ibrahim, your comment to what uh, Amos has said, and then if you can uh, talk about Jerusalem also. Yes, I'm not, I'm, uh, you know, sort of, I agree fully with uh, what uh, Anna said, and it's uh, quite uh, thorough. Uh, I just want to affirm and confirm, uh, basically, out of my own personal experience. First of all, like, uh, yes, you know, biggest fear of the Palestinian Authority and Fatah is losing control to Hamas in the West Bank. They have a vested interest in working against those. The problem is, as I mentioned earlier now, is that the problem is expanding, not only vis-a-vis -vis Hamas, but it's also an internal problem within Fatah, an internal problem with the other factions and the general disgruntled public. And one thing in terms of security coordination that, you know, that I would actually say it, it, it continues uh, maybe more on the intelligence track than it is on the uh, other security branches uh, track in terms of enforcing uh, certain aspects of certain security activities that the PA should do and wouldn't do because of internal weakness. But I think that, you know, when people compare the situation to the second intifada, I think the missing point there is that a second intifada often pledged sort of like eruption of violence uh, would, would have to uh, uh, see a breakdown of the Israeli-Palestinian security coordination at all tracks. And I mean a breakdown for that to turn into a full-fledged uh, sort of like uh, uh, confrontation. I frankly don't see this as happening. Despite the weaknesses, the PO will continue to assume its role. Uh, uh, and with all due respect, people can sort of like uh, uh, criticize President Abbas Abu Mazen on so many different things. But when it comes to security coordination, 
I think, you know, the man who actually said that this is sacred, he really meant it. And in fact, even before Hamas took over Gaza in 2005, when he, when he was first elected, his, in his election campaigning, he was against violence systematically, ideologically, stating that uh, whether it's again fire uh, rocketing, you know, to at one point he even angered Fatih people when he said that, you know, you should not even throw a stone at an Israeli soldier because this brings, you know, violence. So the man, I think, in terms of his, you know, mentality and mindset and instructions have not changed. The question is, again, with all those factors that we mentioned that weaken security coordination to a point of Israeli, you know, officials complaining about the performance of the Palestinian Authority. That's worrying, but I don't really think, that's my assessment, that it got to a point of, of, of basically collapse or crackdown. It just needs to, uh, you know, uh, to be strengthened. And, you know, again, tackling all those factors that we mentioned will, will strengthen the Palestinian Authority on a longer, medium term and a longer term. So Ibrahim, Amos, before I get to you on, on, uh, on uh, Jerusalem, which is important, um, <laughs> What can, you know, we talk about Israel, we talk about the PA cell, but what can Biden, the Biden administration, the US, the international community, can they play a more direct role and positive role, role in, you know, uh, uh, helping with what's happening now, but also strengthening the PA uh, in meaningful ways? That question is to me. I mean, I think so because you know, it's one of those, the IMF, uh, the International Monetary Fund just came out with a report. And again, those reports calling for reforms and, and really important things to do, right? And uh, expanding the tax base and all these things. But it just seems that there's this uh, uh, catch-22, the PA is too weak to institute these reforms. So, so yeah, I mean, just, just really briefly, this is a, a, a spoiler. I know you are working with IPF on, on, on research projects exactly on this point, but, but as we're looking at the situation now, I mean, you from Ramallah, is there anything that the international community can do? Well, first of all, on the part that has to do with reform, I think, you know, there, uh, yesterday we had, you know, there was a meeting in Ramallah, one in Ramallah and one in New York of the AHLC, the donor community. And I think the, uh, you know, the Palestinian finance minister in his presentation was very clear uh, about the need for time. Uh, you know, reforms, structural reforms in the PA uh, budget and, and fiscal policies and all of that uh, are necessary and due. Uh, but again, you know, the situation is not conducive on the ground to actually move quickly, because if you move quickly, you will just cause further and, and deeper problems. And moving further with the, with the reforms, it will have to actually follow a patient, if you would like, a patient agenda in terms of time, a timetable that actually, uh, you know, gives the PA, it's good to give the PA the ability to do it. The, uh, it's good to have the vision uh, and the recommendations and I, having a defined, identified the problems. Uh, and recommended the solutions, but you know this is not really a good time to move with these things because again, uh, the problem is on the ground. The situation is not going to stay as is. In fact, there is a very serious concern that this would implode. Um, if I may, actually, just add one uh, one point on um, on the question of uh, the uh, uh, the Haram Sharif, Aqsa Temple Mount, um, and. Unless you know you want to raise this later, I'm, I'm fine with it. But but uh, you know I think it's a very important issue and piece that also uh, creates problems for the Palestinian Authority, if, in, including inside Area A. Like the flashpoints are always on what happens in Jerusalem and what happens on the side. But there is lots of blame to the Palestinian Authority for failing to do anything domestically, which adds to the flare-up and frustrations of the of the public. And now. It's really the very wrong time, you know, for any flare-ups there because the situation against the Palestinian Authority in Area A, in Jenin, in Nablus, in Hebron, and elsewhere is already boiling. You know, so I just wanted to mention this because you're right raising it, and it's a serious concern that has not really gone away and it keeps coming back. Um, and you know, the more we have of it, I think the more it contributes to the narrative of failure of the PA to deliver on anything, including on maintaining you know, like the uh, Khan in, in, in Haram al-Sharif and preventing those who want to do harm with it because there is a perception that Jewish extremists who go to the Haram are not about visiting the Haram as the Israeli government say, but they declare that they want to destroy it and build the temple in its place. Now, people say this is not real. This is just a bluff. Well, it's a perception because people do say it on the Israeli, you know, Jewish radical side activist temple mount organizations and people on the Palestinian side and even 
even larger, you know, uh, wider scale in, in the region, believe it. So it becomes, you know, uh, it creates a dynamic of its own. Thank you, Ibrahim. I'm with you. I know you you wrote about it also, but Jerusalem. Okay, uh, a, a few words about Jerusalem, Ibrahim. I think covered most of the uh, important stuff here. If we look at the past, many uh, rounds of violence began um, in Jerusalem and more specifically uh, regarding the Temple Mount and especially Guardian of the Walls, the Operation May 2021. Most of this was about um, incidents uh, around Ramadan in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, fears, uh, again, Muslim and Arab fears about Israel breaking the status quo there. And finally, Hamas, um, deciding to to use the situation in order to present itself as the defender of uh, al-Aqsa uh, so to speak so this was the background for uh, May 2021 uh, 21 which was the most serious round of violence we've had for uh, many years this time it actually started elsewhere those attacks in March and uh, March through May were mostly as i said initiated by young palestinians frustrated and so on lone wolves local groups and so on had nothing to do with Jerusalem Sometimes maybe Jerusalem was mentioned as an excuse, but it wasn't the the, the it wasn't at the the center of discussion. Right now, as we approach the high holidays, uh, the Jewish high holidays, it may become a bigger problem because the frustration on the Palestinian side, claiming that Israel is gradually changing the status quo, is growing. And uh, if you look at the sheer numbers, there are in fact, as you mentioned, many more Jews actually on the Temple Mount, close to Al Aqsa. Than before, the police and the different governments are allowing that. Um, it, but in the long run, it may create uh, more tension. Um, a lot of this seems um, tactical or even petty, but um, I know, for instance, that senior uh, officers in the IDF were uh, startled to hear two or three weeks ago that a different gate was used for Israeli uh, Jewish entrance to the Temple Mount. Um, uh, because of some uh, tactical police decision, any kind of action, which may be explained that, you know, uh, the facts on the ground at a specific moment could be translated to more conspiracy theories or more fears on the Palestinian side. And this is why everything becomes so volatile come uh, the high holidays. And the police have already announced that there will be a record number of policemen all over the country, but especially in Jerusalem, because they fear more incidents in, in, in the next few weeks. Thank you, Amos. And we'll stay with you. I guess I want to ask both of you. It was just reported, it was reported yesterday that Saudi Arabia, uh, the European Union and the Arab League will hold a closed ministerial meeting next week to uh, revive or discuss a revival of the Saudi, the Arab Peace Initiative, which as our audience may remember was a kind of revolutionary initiative uh, uh, launched initially in 2002, but by the Saudi leadership that promised that in, in exchange for peace with the Palestinians, Israel will be accepted into the Arab uh, and Muslim world, right? We're going to have peace with 22 Arab states and uh, 57 um, Muslim states all, all, all over. And, and there was a, a perception in on the Israeli side, at least, that with the Abraham Accord side, that the Arab world uh, no longer cares about you know, the Palestinians, that it's no longer a precondition for moving forward on normalization, as was the case. And, uh, and the normalization with the rest of the Arab world is just a, a matter of time. It's not a question of if, right? It's a question of when. So I'm curious if you're hearing in your circles any discussion about this relaunch of the Arab Peace Initiative and if there's uh, any thinking about it on the Israeli side. So the idea was floated recently during the summer. There were all kinds of discussions, um, informal discussions. It was mentioned in Washington, in Riyadh, and in Jerusalem as well. I don't know how serious this is right now, but it's quite clear two years after the Abraham Accords that things have not moved ahead as quickly as some in Israel uh, hoped. And, and if you, look, you can look at the Arab initiative, you can say it's a, it's a positive step. On the other hand, 
it's quite different than Netanyahu's hopes that it would be uh, that the you know that the Abraham Accords would serve as a sort of a bypass to the Palestinian conflict that we can actually go ahead and live happily ever after with the Gulf states while uh, doing nothing on the Palestinian uh, issue. This isn't the case. I think we have to see this as part of the attempts of the Saudis and especially MBS of becoming more relevant in the region. They were sort of a pariah, treated as a sort of a pariah after the Khashoggi affair. Uh, four years ago, we saw Biden's visit, President Biden's visit there in July. It turned out that uh, many important liberal American principles became less important once the uh, uh, the huge uh, fuel and gas uh, crisis um, 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 arrived on, on American shores because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, we're told that the relationship is, is, is gradually improving between Washington and Riyadh. This may be another step forward. I, yeah, I may be terribly wrong on this. My guess is that if something happens, it will be after the midterms. Everything else, Ukraine is already a huge uh, achievement for the Biden uh, uh, foreign policy. Iran is put on a sort of a back burner until the midterms. I, I don't see this. I, I don't see anybody risking the Saudis and, and, and what it would do to Israeli elections right now. I may be wrong. It will happen after November and we'll have to see who becomes Israeli prime minister to see if something serious uh, happens. Um, thank you, uh, Allison. I, I mean, um, there was a meeting, right? We know we know the meeting took place. We know it was a high ranking officials. How serious it is, I'm, I'm not sure. But, but Ibrahim, to you, I guess, what's the view from Ramallah? Do you expect uh, this relaunch of the Saudi peace initiative or if it's really a relaunch? Uh, is going to change anything in the Palestinian mindset that obviously they were very upset with the Abraham Accords, which they uh, perceived as a stab in the back. Yes, uh, the, the truth is that yes, any any uh, efforts to actually revive, uh, you know, like the Arab Peace Initiative, which again was meant, as Amos mentioned, at least you know by the former Israeli Prime Minister, the Arab Accords, you know, the Arab, the Abraham Accords were, were meant to bypass the Arab Peace Initiative and bypass the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So in many ways, it's, it's very good news for the Palestinians if you put this back on track. The question is how serious this effort is and how much Israel, uh, uh, you know, post-elections uh, will, will put into that. And, uh, you know, uh, I would just want to uh, mention that you know, there was a perception out there or some wanted to portray the Palestinian position as being anti-normalization between Arab countries and Israel. And in defense of the Palestinian position, I would actually say that, you know, the problem that, you know, the Palestinian you know, leadership saw in the uh, Abraham Accords is that, you know, what it was meant to do, which is like circumvent the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, because the Arab Peace Initiative also calls for normalization. In fact, it calls for full normalization between Israel and Arab countries and Islamic countries, because the Arab Peace Initiative was endorsed by Islamic summits, not only by Arab uh, League summits. So, you know, if if that effort, you know, picks up momentum and becomes like a serious debate with Israel, uh, you know, involved in it, involved in on a path that is going essentially to work towards two-state solution with the Arab Peace Initiative as the engine or like the, the mechanism for it, then I think that the Palestinians would be the first one to, uh, to be basically uh, on the table. Um, you you asked me a question earlier, uh, Shira. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to uh, sort of like uh, ignore it, but you know the question about the international community and the U.S. You know, I have to tell you, I'm very frank and you know uh, with all openness and candor. In my experience, having worked so many years with the U.S. administrations, not one successive ones, I, I think. If you have positive momentum, if you have Israelis and Palestinians with straight minds and serious sort of like interest and genuine uh, willingness to move forward, you wouldn't really have other than the US and lobbying the international community to support and help and promote. However, if you have a, a standoff and a complete sort of like a boycott like we had in the past decade, uh, you know, they had to manage the, the, uh, uh, the crisis. Um, and many times on both ways. And by the way, they get blamed from both sides. Um, but, you know, like there isn't anything strategic that they can do. Uh, and sometimes I actually, you know, a, a Palestinian and fellow Palestinians here would actually say, hey, the US is always supporting Israel and, you know, refuses to push Israel to do certain things. 
Uh, and my answer to this, having worked with them again, is that the US couldn't even push the Palestinians to do certain things either. I mean, you know, they had so many demands and asks from the Palestinians on so many different topics and issues. And the answer would be no. Uh, and that included Trump administration. So, you know, there are limitations to what they can do. And I think this pushes us back, both Palestinians and Israelis, to be in the steering wheel and help from the, from the, uh, from the US and other uh, friend countries around the, you know, like the Europeans and others would, would come almost automatically and instantly. Um, this is what I meant to actually say. So I don't really have high hopes having others coming to solve the problem. I just see that the momentum needs to be created from here. And if both Palestinians and Israelis choose not to, then it's not. It's you know going to stay in circuits. Sadly. Well, thank you for uh, this uh, sobering ending, but I think you describe a reality which we, we all sadly agree with you. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Ibrahim and Amos, thank you uh, for your time and for joining us. Once thank again, you. I would like to thank our supporters uh, who are with us on today's call. Your generosity makes programs like this possible. Again, if you have not yet done so, please consider making contribution today at israelpolicyforum.org. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be posted on the briefings page of our website. And um, also I encourage you to subscribe to our podcast, the Israel Policy Pod, and to receive our, uh, the weekly Kapla column in your mailbox and other uh, resources. Um, Please stay tuned for our next uh, video briefing. And until then, for those of you who are observing, Shana Tova. Shana Tova.